As we enter into this service, I was praying that God would help us have more faith after this worship hour service. I hope and pray that God will give us more faith. I'm very glad that we talk about faith in the Sabbath school, that we sing about faith and trust in God. And uh, brethren, we probably do not realize how much more faith we could have if we would really trust the Lord as we should or we could. I'd like to give tribute to Brother Orville, who this week communicated with me through email and uh, somehow brought to my attention uh, some thought topics that we, uh, about which we commune, uh, communicate and discuss on creation and evolution. And also I would like to uh, give tribute to our late brother Gabor Horvath, who so often in our church was bringing up this topic of creation and faith in God the Creator. Brothers and sisters, I'd like to read from the book of Hebrews today, the topic which is not strange to us, which is not something new to us, but I believe it's of great importance for all of us who are here, especially for younger generation of believers. Some of our brethren are away this week, or this weekend, um, uh, because of the March break, but those who are here, and those who join us through internet, who we greet, um, we believe that we'll benefit from this sermon and study today. Now, if I would ask you a question, what is the book of Hebrews all about? It's faith, that's right. Now, Apostle Paul, we believe that he's the author of the book of Hebrews. He's a, in the book of Hebrews, there are different great, great themes. Book of Hebrews was written uh, in the period just before destruction of Jerusalem Temple. This is most... Uh, uh, Bible scholars believe, and I believe too. But when a Christian community was, especially Jewish Christian community, was going through struggles and, and, and a crisis of faith, and the Apostle Paul wanted to encourage them to have trust in Jesus Christ, to have faith in God, in Jesus who is, who is in the heavenly sanctuary, that this earthly structure, this earthly temple, whatever is there, will is, will be gone soon, that they should not look at earthly things, but look at heavenly things. What is Jesus Christ, our high priest and our savior? So we have in the first chapter, Jesus Christ, who is higher than any angel. In chapter two, we are having Jesus Christ, who is at the level of us human beings. And uh, so uh, he is our brother. He has the same flesh and same blood, and he came, he's our high priest. And then in chapter 3, we are talking about faith, actually, and, and uh, the need of faith, and chapter 4 as well, and we see the history of Israel, how Israelites in the wilderness provoked the Lord because they did not have faith in God. So how faith is very important, and then we talk about heavenly sanctuary. And then when we come to chapter 11, chapter 11 is the whole chapter is about the faith, and if you, if you look in chapter 11 of um, Hebrews, let us read verse 1. Now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. So can we say we have a faith in things we see? We don't have faith. You, you have knowledge about the things you see. I can see you in this sanctuary today, this morning, and I see your faces, and you see your facial expressions. I hear your voices. You hear me. So we don't need faith. This is reality, face-to-face -face communication. But now if you don't see face-to-face, -face, you need faith. Now, we talk about Jesus Christ and his disciples. Now, they saw him face-to-face -face for three and a half years, and then Jesus died and resurrected and ascended. Now, did the disciples who saw Jesus face to face, did they need faith in him after ascension? Yes. What did they do first according, acting on faith? What did the disciples do? They assembled together in the upper room. They were praying for the promise, you know, of Holy Spirit. God, Jesus made a promise. And what else, what other promise did Jesus make to the disciples? That he will come again, right? Do you need faith for that? 
Of course, we need faith in second coming of Lord Jesus Christ today. So see, faith is, was needed even for the disciples who saw Jesus Christ face to face. But if we move a little bit further, we will talk that faith, we talk about righteousness by faith. And that we can obtain it only because God says so. How do you know when you pray for forgiveness of sins? How do you know that your sins and my sins are forgiven? How do we know that? By faith. By faith. Absolutely, you believe. We believe that God is faithful and just to forgive our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness, right? This is by faith. You see, faith is essential. You can do anything uh, without faith. So, when we talk about this, righteousness by faith is obtained uh, by faith, of course, in the grace of God and the word of God and what Jesus has done for us. But if we go a little bit further, uh, but when I talk about faith, uh, faith is the substance of, substance of things hoped for. I will come to that a little bit later on in the study today, but please remember one thing. When we talk about faith, Biblical faith, we are not talking about blind faith. We are not talking about jumping into dark without any evidence whatsoever that we can trust God. Do you agree with me? Do we have evidences that we can trust God? We do. So our faith is not a blind faith. It's an intelligent faith. God gave us many evidences about his existence, about his character, about his love. And in our life as well, so we have reason. For example, uh, I'll give you a very simple example. If you are going to a um, medical doctor and you enter into the, his office and you have a condition. Uh, in our family, we had this week one situation where we had to go to the hospital for a um, certain, you know, fracture. And uh, so you come to emergency department and there are there's physicians there who are, you know, doing the work. And how do you entrust yourself to, to that physician? You, you go by faith, right? But you, you, you have some reasons to believe that he's competent, right? Because he's working in that institution. I have heard about physicians who were performing medical services without, be, without being properly licensed. Not in Canada, but in some other countries. <laughs> but this is very rare. And these people are really punished. But generally, people, when you go to the medical building or hospital, you have some reasons, good reasons, to trust these people. So you see... There are, there, there are procedures how you work there, you know, or if you go to dentist chair and so on. So you see, we do not have blind faith. We have reasonable faith, even in day-to-day -day life and, and so on. So when we talk about faith in the book of Hebrews, this is the, not a blind faith, but it's faith. It's faith. You need to make that step by faith to, you know, Get in the plane because you trust the person is a licensed, experienced pilot and he's not drunk, right? So you have faith, but it's not blind faith. But let's go to verses 2 and 3 in Hebrews. For by it, or by faith, the elders obtain a good report. Through faith, now this is the key verse, through faith we understand that the worlds were framed by the word of God, so that things which are seen were not made of things which do appear. So how the world was framed, how the world was created, the visible things, how they were created? By the word of God. By the word, please remember, this is a very, very important expression here, or thought in this sermon. The world, everything material, everything visible was created by the world, word of God. Now, what does the Bible say in Genesis 1-1? In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. How do you know that? Have you been there to see when God create, was creating this world? We haven't been there. Now, the Bible doesn't say here that through science we understand that the worlds were framed by the word of God. Does it say so? 
What does it say? Through faith, we understand that the worlds were framed by the Word of God. This sermon will be about creationism, biblical concept of creation. And also, uh, it will be somewhat polemic with people who claim to be Christians, but who embrace so-called theistic evolution, who believe that God created, but somehow he did not create everything, but there was something else. God needed assistance of an evolutionary process to bring things into existence. So God created everything out of nothing. The Bible says here, by faith we understand that the worlds were framed by the word of God so that the things which are seen, visible things, were not made of things which do appear. So God was not using some amorphous, shapeless matter to create the world. He was creating out of nothing. We call it a fiat creation, out of nothing. Hebrew word in the beginning God created bara means creating of nothing. And even if you go to the Big Bang theory, they believe that out of nothing the universe came into existence. They have no explanation. So the Hebrew word bara means only God can bara. Human beings can asa. Asa means using existing matter to do something, to make something. We can use the wood to make the pulpit or, you know, whatever, some chemical compounds to make this carpet, whatever. But we cannot create out of nothing. Only God can do that. So the Bible teaches us clearly that God creates out of nothing. So this is the biblical concept of creation. He just spoke and it came into existence. This shows how powerful God is. But now I want to tell you, brothers and sisters, that faith and creation are inseparably connected. We cannot have a genuine biblical faith if we do not have the faith in God, the Creator. Do you understand that? It's a very important concept. You will see later on. We cannot have a saving, genuine faith if we do not have the faith in God, the Creator. It's very important. So if we move, move forward in Romans 4.3, I'll tell you how it works, how it works with salvation. In Romans 4.3, I had, uh, had a sermon here on that, on Abraham and Isaac, how Isaac was born. In Romans 4.3, Apostle Paul is teaching the righteousness by faith, and then he's using the example of Abraham and how a son was born, son of a promise to patriarch Abraham. And now if you read in Romans 4.3, it says... For what says the scripture? Abraham believed God and it was counted unto him for righteousness. You know the story. I will not read, uh, go through details. Abraham did not have an heir. And God appeared one day to him and he said, you, you know, you are blessed and you will be blessed. I'm your shield. And he said, well, good God, but there will be many people coming from you, God says to Abraham. And Abraham says, God, how this will be? I have no heir. And this is my servant, Eliezer. He is my heir. And God says, no, he will not be your heir. From your own bowels, son will come. You will have an heir, biological heir. And then, what happened next? If you read in Genesis 15, 6 to 7, verses 6 and 7, you see what God did to help to teach Abraham about faith, about himself. And he brought him forth abroad and said, Look now towards heaven and tell the stars, if thou be able to number them. And he said unto him, So shall thy seed be. And he, Abraham, believed in the Lord, and he counted it to him for righteousness. <laughs> now what did God do? To generate genuine faith, saving faith that was counted for righteousness. He was showing to Abraham the sky in the night. You know, if you are in the wilderness, if you are there in the desert where, you know, whatever Abraham lived, when you go out in the night, it's a beautiful sight. You know, this shimmering, you know, the sky is full of stars. You see so many stars. I mean, it's amazing. I was looking at it. I was, I like to gaze in the stars. It's so impressive. 
You, you, it's, it's amazing, like a, sea, a sand of the sea. And now God says to Abraham, can you count these stars? And we cannot do it. It's amazing. <laughs> he said, so shall your seed be. But God was showing Abraham something else. He was showing, look, Abraham, who created this? Who brought, who put it up, these stars in the sky? Who is keeping them in the orbit? What is it energy coming from? How they came into existence? And this was implied, answer was implied. I did it. I am the creator. What is impossible for me? What is impossible for me? And Abraham believed God. He believed God, the creator, that that, that same God who created this world, that he can give him a son, although he was now beyond the child. I mean, he could not, they could not procreate. Sarah was 90, he was 100, beyond childbearing age. So we can only believe that God is the creator through faith. And Hebrews 11 makes it an abundantly clear. Later on, Abraham see, uh, sees Isaac born. We all have seen the evidences of God's love in, in carrying our lives. But when it comes to creation of the world, this is something that we can understand only through faith. And this is what we learn from Romans 4, 3. Abraham believed it was counted to him for righteousness. Genesis 15, you know, the story in Hebrews 11, 3. So th show us that if we want to demonstrate our faith in God, we must first acknowledge God as the creator. The same is word, brothers and sisters, and this is very important. I don't know, have you ever re realized that? The same word that created this world this word is here. Did you know that? This is the word of the living God. This word has a power to transform our lives. If you believe that. This word. It's alive. It's truth. Sister White says that these words are as authentic and as truthful today as if God would be speaking audibly to our ears. Same thing. Same thing. So this, is the, this word has a recreative power. In 1 Peter 1.23, look at this. Being born again, not of a corruptible seed, but of incorruptible, by the word of God, which liveth, and abide it forever. You see that? Jesus said, the heaven and earth will pass, but my word will never pass. We are born again, not of corruptible seed, but incorruptible, which is the word of the living God. The word of God brings new life. When you hear the word of God and you have faith, it produces new life in you. When God asked Abraham to sacrifice Isaac, Abraham believed that God can bring Isaac back to life through resurrection. Do you know that? This is amazing. First of all, he gave him a child through a miracle. And then later on, he asked of him to sacrifice that child, unique child. And Abraham had a terrible struggle. You know, we as parents can a little bit have, you know, faint, faintly understand this. Some of you know that Alex had this week uh, in accident and, you know, fracture. And, uh, you know, we as parents, we, we, we sympathize, you know, it, it, it affects you. And at the moment when he hit the ground and had the fracture, he said that it was such a pain, I wanted to cry, but my voice was not sufficiently strong to cry. It was such a sharp pain. You know, when you hear that, it... it you know, it hurts you, shocks you. <sighs> but now God says, you take this son and you kill him. <sighs> but look, what, who is, what was Abraham's fate? You read in Hebrews eleven nineteen. Accounting 
Abraham had such a faith, accounting that God was able to raise him up even from the dead, from whence also he received him in a figure. Abraham believed that God can resurrect Isaac even if he would be dead. See what is a faith? That's faith. The God who creates, he can recreate, he can bring back to life. And when my uncle was here, uh, just uh, we were talking about faith, and he said, look, so many times back in Croatia, there were funerals, and, you know, I was going to funerals, uh, colleagues of friends and people who do not have faith. And so you know, when people are placed in the grave and the, the earth is put back, you know, people walk away. And the priest is talking, reading from the Bible about resurrection, and you know, people are saying, wow, that's it. No one comes out from this, from earth. No way. People who do not have faith in God, you know, they don't believe in the resurrection. But you know one, everyone will be resurrected. Those who believe in God and those who do not believe in God, everyone will be resurrected. But at different resurrections, different times. Now, if we do not have faith in the power of God's word to create material world out of nothing, then we, have, we will not have the faith in God to recreate our lives by producing in us a new birth. If we don't have faith in God that he created this world in six literal days and rested the seventh day, if we don't have faith in that, how can we have faith that God can recreate, bring a new life in us? Do you understand that? And I will read from the Patriarchs and Prophets in chapter 9, it, under the title, The Literal Week, just a few paragraphs. I'll tell you why. Our young people are going to the schools, to the colleges, universities, high schools, wherever, where dominant, prevailing doctrine of worldview is evolutionary worldview. And unfortunately, many Christian scientists also teach theistic evolution. So the six days of creation were not six days of creation, literal days, but they were, you know, long periods of time. So God could not speak and create. We needed, you know, millions of years. Now look what spiritual prophecy says about this particular topic. Page 111, paragraph 1. Like the Sabbath, the week originated at creation. And it has been preserved and brought down to us through Bible history. God himself measured off the first week as a sample for successive weeks to the close of time. Like every other, it consisted of seven literal days. Six days were employed in the work of creation. Upon the seventh, God rested. And he then blessed this day and set it apart as a day of rest for man. Do you hear that? Can it be more simple, more clear? And some seven Adventists even begin to question, you know, six days of creation as literal days under the influence of evolutionary theory. Six literal days and the literal seventh day God measured off he didn't need 7 million or 7 billion years. He didn't need that. Now let me go on. On page 112, same source, Patriarchs and Prophets. Geologists claim to find evidence from the earth itself that it is very much older than the mosaic record teaches. Bones of men and animals, as well as instruments of warfare, petrified trees, etc., much larger than any that now exist, or that have existed for thousands of years, have been discovered. And from this it is inferred that the earth was populated long before the time brought to view in the record of creation and by race of beings vastly superior in size to any man now living. Such reasoning has led many professed Bible believers to adopt the position that the days of creation were vast indefinite periods. So you see... <clears throat> Some discoveries of science show geology, you know, fossil records, show us that there existed in the past some very large creatures, much, much greater than what we see today. So some people believe, oh, well, who knows how many, ye how many years, how long time, you know, this was, they existed, you know. Now, let me finish with one more uh, statement from the same source, page 112. 
<coughs> paragraph 3. But apart from Bible history, geology can prove nothing. Wow! Hear that? Apart from Bible history, geology can prove nothing. I will elaborate on that. I'm not against science. We are not against science. But when we go to the very distant future, when you cannot replicate scientifically, you know, in a laboratory today, they have no sure knowledge about what happened in the distant past. Apart from the Bible, geology can prove nothing. They can just discover, but interpretation of the evidence, they don't have sure guide. Those who reason so confidently upon its discoveries have no adequate conception of the size of men, animals, and trees before the flood, or to the, no, you see, flood, before the flood, the world was different before the flood. The atmosphere was different. And there were different constants. So they have no clue how that was before the flood. Or of the great changes which then took place. After the flood, great changes took place in the world in which we, in which we live. And this is where we need faith. Relics found in the tree in the earth do give evidence of conditions differing in many respects from the present, but the time when these conditions existed can be learned only from the inspired record. So we can learn about the conditions that existed before the flood only from the inspired record, and the science cannot give us a reliable account of the conditions of the world before the flood. In the history of the flood, inspiration has explained that which geology alone could never fathom. In the days of Noah, men, animals, and trees, many times larger than now exist, were buried and thus preserved as an evidence to later generations that the antediluvians perished by a flood. God designed that the discovery of these things should establish faith in inspired history. But men, with their vain reasoning, fall into the same error as did the people before the flood. That th the things which God gave them as a benefit, they turn into a curse by making a wrong use of them. Patriarchs and Prophets 112. Brothers and sisters, we are living in a world that is opposed to God and a scientific community. Academia today, we are living in the new dark ages. If you dare to question and challenge the so-called assured results of scientific discovery, you are branded. <laughs> you are, you are pre-scientific. And there is a reason why Satan does it. And we will talk about that. Now, let me give you just a little hint how the archaeology, which methods archaeology and geology use about dating of the, you know, certain things. For archaeological discoveries, for organic matter, which means trees and plants, I mean, and, uh, you know, whatever, human animals and so on, they call so-called so carbon radio dating. And what does it mean, actually, very briefly? I, I'm not a scientist, but I have read a little bit. Carbon-based radiometric dating is used not to determine the age of the rocks. And there is a reason for that. Carbon dating works only for the objects that are younger, how they say, um, uh, than about 50,000 years. And most rocks of interest are older than that, for they use other chemical elements, radioactive isotopes, to you know, date rocks. And so how it works is actually that every chemical element has isotopes, and some of them are radioisotopes, which means that they simply have decay. All organic matter takes carbon, you know, stable carbon like C12, and C14 carbon is decaying. And they know the rate of decay, it turns into nitrogen. So by Measuring, for if, if the plant or animal dies, that C14 carbon radioisotope is diminished, and they know it takes about 5,730 5, years to have you know, half time. And so by that, they can approximately you know, measure the age of certain organic matter. 
But what we are told that before the flood, the conditions in the world were different. So you see, you cannot, you cannot completely rely on certain processes, chemical and physical processes that we see today, to date something which is beyond, which was completely different. And Bible teaches clearly that the conditions in the world before the flood were different than now. Now, the content, contemporary science is based on so-called uniformitarian principle. That everything what we see today, what we see is existing, it was always like that from the beginning of the world. But the Bible says it was not like that. Believe it or not, the Bible talks about that. If you go to the book, uh, 2 Peter 3, verses 3 to 7, look what Peter said. That scoffers or unbelievers will come and challenge the biblical account of creation. Knowing this first, that scoffers will come in the last days. Do we live in the last days? Yes, we do. Walking according to their own lusts. Do they walk according to their own lusts? They do. And saying, where is the promise of his coming? For since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they were from the beginning of creation. You see what they say? Uniformitarian. Nothing has changed. Everything is the same from the creation. Now, for this, they will fully forget that by the word of God, the heavens were of old, and the earth standing out of water and in the water. So the water was above the sky, and water was down. So when the flood came, that water is above the sky were open, and the water was coming down. So they ignored that. By which the world then, that then existed, perished, being flooded with water. But the heavens and the earth, which are now preserved by the same word, are reserved for fire until the day of judgment and perdition of an ungodly man. So you see, brothers and sisters, Apostle Peter here in chapter 3, verse uh, He's saying clearly that in the last days there will be people, unbelievers, scoffers, who will be mocking the biblical account of creation. And he will be saying, no, everything is the same from the creation, from the beginning. There was no change, no flood. No change in the, how the, the world operates. They willfully are ignorant. But interestingly, in ancient nations, any old nations, any part of the world you go, you are having the story of the flood. You are having in the East, you are having in the Americas, Everyone talks about flood. Okay, myths, legends, but they talk about flood. Brethren, could you think about that, that this world is not older than 6,000 years? It's not so old? People live 1,000 years, few generations. So this was transmitted. This was transmitted. So we come back to Bible, Hebrews 11.3. I repeat the verse. We affirm through faith, we understand that the worlds were framed by the word of God, so that things which are seen were not made of things which do appear. This is faith. Science cannot prove that. Science has different theories, speculations. And we should not go by that, because our faith can be in jeopardy. Now, the faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. We were not there when God created his world. We do not see it. But by the eyes of faith, we accept the claim of the scripture that God, by his word, created the world out of nothing. Now, if we do not believe the first 11 chapters of Genesis, how can we trust any of God's word? So if we say that the first 11 chapters of Genesis is a legend, a mythology, it's a poetry. This is what many Christians today say. How can we trust the rest of the Bible? If you go in the New Testament, Jesus is referring to Noah in the flood, right? So is this also reliable? Can we trust it? That's a question. See how Satan insidiously undermines, erodes the trust in the Word of God? And unfortunately, it affects many good Christians. Faith is shaken. If we do not, but look, brethren, what are the consequences? If we do not believe in God, the creator like Abraham, can you have the faith that makes you righteous, that will produce righteousness in God, righteousness of God? 
So creation is not an academic argument where one can hold one theory and another, another theory. The Bible is clear that the only way to honor God properly is to accept his righteousness, and accept his righteousness is to accept his, him as a creator. And this is the beginning point of faith. Again, through faith we understand that the worlds were framed by the word of God so that the things which are seen were not made of things which do appear. Science cannot explain how something can come into existence out of nothing. This takes faith. The faith teaches us that God also can take our sinful life and recreate it by making a new life of righteousness. Now let's go just for a moment to Hebrews 11.4, the next verse. Let us see the first man, Cain and Abel, and how they responded. How was their faith manifested? Verse 4, By faith Abel offered unto God a more excellent sacrifice than Cain, by which he obtained witness that he was righteous, God testifying of his gifts, and by it he being dead yet speaketh. Now think about Cain and Abel. Cain was an um, agricultural man, and Abel was the, far, uh, he was the shepherd, right? He was having the flock. And uh, so God was asking the best to offer as a sacrifice. So Cain is bringing the best of what he produced, right? Produce, plants, the best. And Abel is bringing the best of his flock. Now God accepts Abel's sacrifice and rejects Cain's sacrifice. Let me ask you the question. How did Abel bring the good sacrifice? How did he do it? By faith. He believed what God said, right? God said, bring this. He brought that. Cain wanted to do something else. He was working hard, I'm not assuming, you know, tilling the ground, in the sweat of his brow, and he produced something and he brought it best. But God could not accept it. So, brothers and sisters, when we worship God, it's not arbitrary what I like, how hard I work, and I want to bring it to God. No. God has a way how we worship. So, in this particular story, we see also find that Cain was angry with God because God was expelled him from the Garden of Eden and his father. And so you see, then we go to verse 5 about Enoch. By faith, Enoch was translated that he should not see death and was not found because God had translated him for before his translation, he had this testimony that he pleased God. Some uh, Bible uh, students have noticed that, interestingly, the people who are mentioned here are men of faith. Some had faith and died. Some had faith and were translated without seeing that. Who died as the first man who had faith mentioned? Abel, right? He died. Enoch had faith and he was translated without seeing that. On the other hand, we have also uh, men like Noah, who had faith, and he was preserved in the ark. He did not, and his family, you know, drowned with the flood. And then we have another man who had faith like Abraham, and he was told to leave his place. So anyway, God, you know, God can, what, what it teaches us, these, these experiences of faith, you can have faith and have a certain experiences in this life that may be, humanly speaking, not so pleasant. Another person, you know, everything goes well. So you see the outcomes on this earth are not always absolute predictor what will happen long term. But all people who had faith in the new life, will they be satisfied? Will they be blessed? Of course, of course. But you see, in this life, sometimes we can have different, you know, experiences and different challenges in life. Enoch was translated without seeing that. He is a representation of God's last day people. Enoch was in this world not of this world. He witnessed the people around him, but he yearned to be in the other world, and God took him. Brothers and sisters, Enoch is a representative of those who will be living in the last days who will be translated without seeing death. He was a holy man. 
He was walking with God day by day. Now, how Enoch achieved that holiness of life? Huh? What do you think? How? By faith. Trusting God. Faith that can transform the life. Now, if you are having experiences as I do, I spoke with some of you in the course of this week and in the past, and I appreciate that some of you are s striving to reach Christian perfection, to overcome sin, to be more like Jesus. And then what do you find? You find something pulling you down. You feel, find things that I know. Brothers and sisters, the question is, can we have the faith to overcome these sins? Amen. Some Adventists say today, well, we cannot become perfect overcomers. We cannot completely overcome. Spiritual prophecy says, if you say, I cannot overcome, you will surely be lost. If the Holy Spirit convicts you of any sin, and you do not go to God by faith, seeking His grace and transformation, you don't have faith to transform your life, you and I will be lost. Do, you, do we agree on that? You see, brethren, 144,000 and the Reform Movement, uh, we teach 144,000. This is a very serious topic. Very serious topic. And I connect it with the faith in God, the Creator. If we don't have that faith that God created this world in six literal days, the rest of the seventh day, gave us the memorial of creation. If, if Sabbath is the sign, this day that we keep today is the sign of God's creative power. Do you understand that? When we keep the Sabbath, Sabbath is, I will make you holy. You will keep my Sabbaths. You will be a holy nation. Sabbath is the sign of God's creative and recreative power. Absolutely. So, brethren, we have to have this faith in God, the creator of which the Sabbath is the special sign. Special relationship. We don't just keep the Sabbath, we keep all the commandments. And I pray that God would, I will, I will have to stop and do this uh, sermon in two parts, because there is a second part where I, it's very interesting, where I would go a little bit in science and, and Bible and show how theistic evolution does not work. Uh, but I just want to show you how faith operates. We need that faith in God, trust in God's word. God can do amazing things today. Now, verse 6, but without faith, it is impossible to please him, for he that cometh to God must believe that he is, or he exists, and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. So, without faith, you cannot please God. Now, if, if we don't have a genuine faith, faith in God, the creator, can you please God? I cannot please God. If I believe it, you know, in theistic evolution, this is not the faith in God the Creator. That's another kind of faith. You cannot please God. We can see, we can create all the elaborate scientific methods and procedures we want, but this is not to please God. This will not please God. This will be like Cain bringing the best of his fruit. We may show a lot of human intellectual output, like evolutionary theories, geological theories, astrophysical theories, but this is not going to please God. We know by faith, we understand that the worlds were framed by the Word of God. Brothers and sisters, I want to encourage us, especially our young people, who are exposed to these sinister, dark forces today that are attacking eroding, undermining our faith in God and the Word of God. And millions of Christians, unfortunately, believe that. In the second part, I'll share with you a very interesting other portions about faith, how faith operates, and how it's important for us. Let me just give you a hint. What is the first angel's message? And as soon as the angel flying in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel to proclaim, to preach to all those you know, who live on earth, saying what? Fear God and give glory to Him and worship Him. Who? 
created or made heaven and earth, waters, everything. This is our message. This is our message, brothers and sisters. And the Sabbath, as a sign of his creative power, will be the central point of controversy. This is why we need that faith in God the Creator, who created and who can recreate. Abraham, beautiful example. He gave him son, humanly impossible. He asked to sacrifice the son. He had faith that God can resurrect him. God can resurrect us today. If you have faith, Jesus says, if you have faith, wow, amazing things can happen. So I challenge you, I invite you today, have faith in God, God the Creator. Amen.